So as we have done with our other meetings, um, I'm going to start with um, a statement of the indigenous heritage of the land and also an acknowledgement of contributions of African Americans. And I want to first uh, welcome a few new people to our group this session. Um, Jeremiah LaPlante is the facilities manager for the town <clears throat> and Chris Brestrup is the planning director. So thank you both for taking the time to join us this evening. So I will begin first by saying <clears throat> that I'm Stephanie Chicarello. I'm the sustainability coordinator for the town and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. We ask that the first time you speak, you please identify yourself and also your pronouns. So to begin with our statement, we humbly acknowledge that we stand on Nonatuck land, acknowledging also our neighboring indigenous nations, the Nipmuc and the Wampanoag to the east, the Mohegan and Pequot to the south, the Mohican to the west, and the Abenaki to the north. And I would also like to read the statement of contribution of African Americans um, by Amherst community leader, Lauren Mills. Amherst recognizes the generations of African Americans that have con contributed to the development of agriculture and historical academic preservation from the past to the present. We also recognize the rich spiritual culture, artistic contribution, and pursuits of justice that have enriched the communities in which African Americans have lived, worked, persevered, and achieved. And normally at this time, I would turn this over to um, Gazi Kaya, but they are unfortunately not able to be with us this evening. So I'm going to go over our group agreements for this session. Um, it's good for us when we have uh, meetings like this to have agreements uh, about the ways we'd like to be respectful of one another. And I'm going to introduce some, um, some of these agreements uh, that we've discussed in previous meetings and that we will apply in this meeting today. First and foremost, please put people in relationships first. Um, think about the issues that we're talking about with one another and how they affect people and think about building understanding rather than winning or getting our individual goals met. So we're not trying to win people to our side and our viewpoint. We're trying to build understanding with one another. Um, also, we want everyone to take care of themselves as part of this meeting um, and each other. And so we encourage you um, to take a break if you need to. Uh, check in with one another if you feel you see something or see someone um, and you uh, can check in with them. Um, if you have children and you need to attend to your children, please by all means do so. Um, if you have pets that need your attention, feel free to take time to attend to your pets. So whatever you need to do, um, feel free to, to step away, use the restroom, get some food, just be comfortable in this space as best you can. Um, we encourage people to keep their cameras on during the meeting, but if for some reason you're not comfortable with doing that or you um, have connection problems, feel free to turn your video off um, as well as your microphone. We ask that unless you're speaking, please keep your microphone off as often it picks up background noise. So we'd appreciate being able to, to hear whoever's speaking. Uh, a second, Agreement is that we would like people to watch our language, um, speak very slowly and clearly so that people um, can understand, avoid jargon that's very technical in nature. Um, pause for translation. We don't necessarily need translation, but um, certainly take your time in what you're saying and be clear and mindful of um, just of. Um, delivering your information to folks. Um, if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand um, and let people know and the, um, the facilitators will acknowledge you uh, if you want to contribute to the conversation. Also, we'd like you to step up and step back. So if you're someone who tends to be quiet, we really encourage you to bring your voice to this conversation and to speak up. And if you're someone who tends to talk a lot, 
please take a moment to step back so that others can have an opportunity to share and have their voices heard as well. Another agreement is that we would like it um, that people don't pry and people keep their information private. So if someone is giving you some information, please don't ask for more. Please allow people to deliver what they're most comfortable with delivering to the conversation and not try to get more and elicit more from them if they're not willing to give it. And also, um, it's important that we understand that people are coming here to this meeting with their own cultural values. And so what is something that is comfortable or normal or acceptable um, in your sphere may not be uh, necessarily so in someone else's. So we want everyone to be respectful of each other's um, cultural backgrounds and to give each other um, space in that and to be open to asking questions. If there's something you don't understand, feel free to ask questions. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Lauren. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Lauren. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm with the consulting team working with Jim and Vivi Kaya, who can't be with us tonight. Um, I'm going to do a little uh, introduction to resilience, but first I'm going to pass it off to our co-chair, Sarah, um, to review some of the homework experiences from our last meeting. So, Sarah, take it away. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, my name is Sarah. <clears throat> I use she, her pronouns, and you will most certainly hear my child in the background. They're playing like, just outside my door. Um, so I apologize in advance. Um, so if you were at last week's meeting, um, our homework, albeit optional homework, um, was to either call or write to your town counselor or counselors if you have two in your district um, to ask that the $80,000 that they have set aside for social justice work, um, to ask that that gets allocated towards establishing avenues for increased participation in town governance. So using that money to make town governance accessible for people who would otherwise not have the capacity or resources or availability to participate. So if you chose to do that exercise, if you wrote to your town counselor, we would love to hear about it. Um, how was the experience? Did you get any feedback? Was it encouraging, frustrating? Um, were there any outcomes? Or maybe even, you know, what did you learn in reflecting on um, what that might look like, right? If, we, if that were to be successful. Um, we would love to hear if you participated in that homework. I wasn't here for the last meeting. So I just want to be clear. So I know there is some Differences with this 80,000, I know the Racial Equity Task Force is looking for, are, what you're saying, are you aligning with what the Racial Equity Task Force want or you're suggesting that the money be done for something else? Yeah. Sarah, I just want to be clear. Yeah, Georgia, thank you for asking. Um, we have, we're not, um, we don't have a member of that group as part of this task force. Um, but to my knowledge, we're trying to, to get in front of town council in a myriad of ways um, and to advocate that that money gets decided upon by the racial equity group. And so our participation is, I think, uh, just another, another um, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, another voice, right? Trying okay. to advocate for ways that we could bring in more people into the realm of making decisions in town governance. Okay, I just wanted to be clear, you know, because I think my problem is that, I mean, I wasn't asked because I mean, like, I'm gonna be quite honest. I mean, people just, are, you know, I just, like I said, I'm in the space because I guess it, you know, and, um, People like, you know, like when I found out about this, I'm like, let it be organically 
done. Let the people of color decide what this is gonna look like. White people cannot decide for us. You know, Dr. King marched, right? MLK marched and they had different visions. And if they were to leave it up to white people back then in the 60s with the movements or even the feminist movement or the LGBTQ because all that was taking place basically simultaneously, nothing would ever get done. So allow black people or people of color to really decide how to, what that looks like. Because if you really want accountability, you know, and, and that's what it lacks. I mean, so I appreciate you using your voice and speaking out on, on behalf of, you know, I'm not officially a member of the racial equity task force. I mean, I collaborate with them. I, you know, give my input when asked, I attend some meetings, um, but people have no clue, right? Like just let it happen, but everybody still wants to control what it looks like that the, the, the school, the, 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 um, the town council wants, you know, Paul Buckleman to put together a committee of people, you know, who are going to do the interview. And, you know, he's not getting people basically because he wants to control it. And that cannot work. You have to let black people or brown people decide if you want real accountability, you allow them to come up with a system that if you really, cause it's going to be uncomfortable, right? It's going to be uncomfortable, but the discomfort is what's going to push growth. The discomfort is what's going to make changes. We can't be just comfortable in this little cocoon where you're really saying, oh yeah, we're having this um, committee and you know we're just going to make it seem, right? Like, oh yeah, we're doing something when we're really doing nothing. And then it's still being controlled by people who are really not, um, who have not excavated their identity to be part that they haven't how can they decide how can a bunch of white people i'm sorry and I'm, I'm not being disrespectful but how can they they the, the town council d decide because they want to also interview i mean what the hell how are they gonna know they don't know you know i mean these shabazz is i mean she's out there you know and i'm just saying it's exhausting it's uh, exhausting and i just have to really i mean about self-care mode so i really i'm very careful I pick my battles and I go into spaces that I think my voice is gonna make a difference and I'm gonna be heard. Because, you know, it's just, it's frustrating just to see on the sideline and you're like, oh my God. You know what I'm saying? There's, there's a lack of, um, to really do, um, people are just not being good brokers in really what they're, what supposedly it seems that they're trying to achieve. So, I mean, yeah. It, it, people have to do the work. People have to do the work in, in, in terms of, it's not doing to one on doing one on one on doing racism workshop and says, okay, yeah, I've got it. No, it's ongoing. It's having conversations. It's listening to people that look like me. It's then it's a piece of black and brown people and listening to what they have to say because they have been traumatized and it's not okay. Thank you, Georgia. I appreciate you being here and I always appreciate everything that you have to say. I think it's, it's so, so, so important. And part of what we've been uncovering in this group is that we want your voice and people who want to be part of town governance to be compensated for the labor that you're doing, that you should be paid for your time and your energy. Um, and so if I wasn't clear about the, the homework, that's what we're trying to do with this task group and in, in town governance going forward. We want, to, we want people of, of any um, background and any, um, any demographic to, to, to break down barriers so that's not just white people in the room. And that's one way that we thought would be perhaps beneficial if not that chunk of money we would like it to come from somewhere else at some point. John, I think you're, um, John, you're on mute. Okay, now, um, I did write to my two District 5 representatives, Shalini and Darcy, um, and I actually did not get a response from Darcy I did get a response from Shalini 
which I don't think understood what I was asking. Um, I will tell you, I'll quote a little bit from the email that I sent to them. Uh, and I don't honestly think that D. Shabazz or anybody else uh, would have a problem with this in the racial equity group. Uh, I started by outlining a number of problems that we discussed in this building task force and also problems that I was aware of elsewhere. And I said one approach to these problems would be to encourage tenants to organize. However, many work and have childcare responsibility that cuts into the time to set up meetings, talk to other individuals about getting involved, represent them themselves before town council or its committees, or to meet with town officials. They also lack the resources to pay for internet access, various kinds of software to support their efforts, funds to pay for printing, et cetera. Without time and other resources, the likelihood that we will see greater participation from renters in town government is vanishingly small. What to do? One idea that was raised at the building task force is to have the town underwrite the costs required to develop a renters coalition. Renters make up an estimated 40% of the Amherst population, yet their current capacity to actually be heard in the halls of town government is not very impressive. We could send everyone nice letters inviting them to enjoy the benefits of greater participation, but that is not likely to be very effective. If we are serious about inviting them in, we need to give them the resources to organize. And uh, so that's basically what I said. There's a little bit more, as I said, outlining problems. I did send copies to, I guess, at least Stephanie and Gaza Chaya. Um, and I don't know if they shared that with other people. But like I said, I really didn't get much of a response. I got no response from Darcy. And honestly, a response from Shalini that suggested that she was uh, confused by what I was asking. Um, I could have followed up with both of them on the phone, but unfortunately, there's been a lot going on in trying to develop affordable housing in Amherst right now, and so I just didn't have the time to do it. I don't know, Georgia, what you think of what I wrote, but uh, I think it was intended to put the resources in the hands of renters, many of whom I know are black and brown people. Sarah, do you know if anybody else wrote letters? Not that we've seen. Um, has anyone? No. I drafted one, but I have not sent it yet. Hi, this is Janine. I didn't even know about the whole writing letter thing, so I didn't do one. We can, um, if you would like to, we can give you the prompt. It's, there's no timeline. It's just something that we wanted to start um, a conversation about. So if you feel like you'd like to do that, we can speak afterwards. Yeah, I think if we don't feel comfortable writing these kinds of letters to town council, then honestly, we're not gonna be very effective as an advocacy group. And as I've said before a couple of times, I do think that's one way we need to see ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, John. Any other thoughts on this particular topic? It needs to, it really needs to be a requirement. Um, that people who are serving in these positions have to do some serious training. They're dealing with a multicultural community and they cannot be making decisions. Um, they can't, how can they make decisions? How can they, you know, they can't make decisions. They don't have the lens. So they really need to go through some training. You know, they have to get some training. It has to be a commitment. They have, it has to be, a, it should be a requirement that they have ongoing training. 
because they're sitting in that space, occupying that space, and they just, it's like, yeah, blinders on, you know, convinced that they're doing the right thing when they're really doing the opposite. You know, what they're doing is, what they're doing is actually harming rather than good. And I mean, the decisions that they have made, some of the decisions that they have made, you know, have clearly demonstrated that, you know, um, that they're just in roles that they're really not up to the part to meet the, um, the, 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 you know, the cultural makeup of the, of the community. Because the decisions that are made are made from the lens that they know and influenced by the people who have the power. You know, I was kind of outraged just off just a quick, when I found out, I mean, I actually caught, spoke at one of the thing when I found out that they had closed all the voting stations and were having one and their response was, I'm like, how does that decision arrive that? They're like, oh, because the people who was for it and against it were equal. And you know, one of the things that one of my mentors have said to me, and I'm like, you know, and I wrote to them also, I said, foundationally, any decision that you make, you know, I was told if you're, in a, if you're at the table, and if you're in the position to make any kind of policy, you, the people who you think of are the people who are marginalized, the people who are vulnerable, the people who are disadvantaged. Because when you make that policy or you make a decision, factor in, in those people, the rest of the people are gonna be okay. And we have to get in the habit of doing that. It's not going to affect the other people. You know what I'm saying? If you take into consideration that, okay, these are the people who want to make sure they're okay in all of this. The other people, yeah, they're going to be okay. Their lives are not going to change. Thank you, Georgia. Both Lauren and Jim are taking diligent notes. so that nothing you say gets forgotten or glossed over. Um, if there's no one else, I think I give it back to Lauren. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just really want to acknowledge some of the things that Georgia and John have both raised around the need for deep listening for creating and allowing for the leadership of black and brown people for sharing power with the black and brown community and for addressing the, the systemic barriers to participation that underlie a lot of what we're talking about. Um, so thank you both for sharing and reflecting on those experiences with the group. Um, it leads in really nicely as well to uh, the piece that I'm going to talk about here. My internet is a little bit spotty, so I apologize in advance. If I do freeze at any point, I'm going to do my best to avoid that. Um, I'm going to share my screen with a few slides to take us through um, a little bit of background about the concept of resilience, um, climate resilience, to tee up the conversation that we're going to have throughout the rest of the meeting about um, the major actions that have come up so far in our conversations. So bear with me one moment while I share my screen. And can everyone see the slide that I have up there? Just thumbs up if yes. Great, thank you. Yes. Awesome. So um, as I mentioned before, my name is Lauren. I use she, her pronouns and Y'all haven't heard that much from me so far in the process because I've been the one in the background diligently taking those notes. Um, but we decided to switch things up a little bit today and Jim is our expert note taker. So thank you, Jim. Um, and I um, wanted to note that though I'm currently living in Portland, Maine, I lived in Western Mass in the Valley for two years while I attended UMass. And um, I'm just extremely grateful to be working with this community and with this group of people um, because it really does have a special place in my heart. So thank you for having me. Um, 
So as I mentioned, we wanted to start off the conversation today with a little bit of a background on the idea of climate resilience. Um, so as we've been talking about climate change with this group, what keeps coming up is that people's lives are pretty unstable right now in terms of things like housing, food, transportation, job security, and all these things are affected by climate change. We've also difficult it is for some folks to live in Amherst and how wonderful it is for others and how connected these things are to systems of governance as Georgia was just speaking about. So then we've been also talking about the drivers of climate change, like burning fossil fuels and um, how that relates to quality of life. So this, we have this um, idea of climate mitigation, which is sort of protecting our environment and, and, and reducing our impacts on the environment. And then we have this idea of climate resilience, which is really about improving quality of life and, and uh, becoming more resilient to climate change. And we wanna keep both of these priorities on the table as we're making this plan. So I'm just gonna go to the next slide. So in the context of climate change, resilience is often defined as a community's ability to bounce back from shocks and stressors like floods, like droughts, power failures, and even pandemics. But what we've heard over the course of our meetings together is that bouncing back to the way things have been only makes sense if you start off from a place of stability and that much of our community is living without that stability right now. We've also been recognizing that this means that many folks in the community are not able to participate in the full range of climate actions that are necessary to achieve the town's goals and that that reality is out of step with our values and our principles. So instead, I wanted to offer a definition of climate resilience as bouncing forward, um, moving toward stability, toward better conditions and toward better outcomes as a way of becoming more resilient to climate change, especially for our renters, our low income residents and our black indigenous and people of color residents. So bouncing forward, what does that mean? It means sharing risks and opportunities more equitably in our community. So when it comes to buildings, which is what we're here to talk about today, this could look like requiring landlords to disclose the energy efficiency of a unit to any prospective renter so that renters can make informed decisions based on the full picture of a unit's cost. This could also look like requiring the participation of local renters in building development and major renovations and upgrades and things like that with the intention of preventing displacement and gentrification, which is something that we've talked about a fair bit with this group. So strategies can both improve our ability to weather climate impacts without having to worry about how we're going to afford our energy bills, for instance, while also addressing equity and encouraging more energy efficient buildings. These are just a couple of examples, um, things for you to chew on. And I'm sure that this group has many other great ideas about what types of actions could um, improve our climate resilience. So, um, and how we can share risks and, and opportunities more equitably in the community. Um, so with that just sort of little intro, I'm gonna pass things over to our co-chair, Jesse, to introduce the major actions that have come out of the process so far and kick off our discussion. Thanks, Lauren. Um, so it, it's funny, and just thinking about this, I, I have to make, <clears throat> I feel like I do need to say that 
the act of listening in this case looks like me talking and um, and so I really want to make this introduction to say that this is we're tr trying to reflect back the, what we've heard um, and I think in the context of we're we're very ready to be wrong. Um, and the idea is, in fact, I really don't mind being wrong. The idea is to be wrong in a context where someone can say, no, you didn't hear me right. No, that's not a good idea. Or you're close, but so that's the context that I think um, this is. And maybe we, we got it right, but essentially these are um, some of the potential ideas and actions that we're talking about um, in this group the coordinated effort and the other groups to put into our plan um, and move forward. And so I think really to, to in earnest begin to convert um, our buildings to use, to produce less greenhouse gas emissions um, through a handful of different ways, electrification, um, reducing the amount of energy places use, supplying renewable energy on site, et cetera. Um, number two is to try to change the, the legislation. We're looking really hard at where we can um, make change um, through legal channels and, and, require, and require buildings. And maybe it's to reach net zero um, but maybe it's just, that may or may not be the right phrase, but to basically to be more resilient, have a lower climate impact, I think is how I would say it. Um, really excited about this idea of prioritizing the rental housing. Um, it's such a, a big part of our community and not just for the climate change aspects, but we've added in these phrases like thermal comfort, acoustic separation, indoor air quality. And, and what that means is um, if you use less energy, but you're hot, still hot in the summer and cold in the winter, that, that doesn't matter. So it's spaces that are more pleasant to be in. That's what thermal comfort is. Acoustic separation, maybe that insulation also gives you greater privacy. So you, you don't have, you're not hearing your neighbor or uh, the weed whacker outside, um, and then indoor air quality. A huge part of improving a building is it's not just about the energy. It's, it's the air you breathe or we all breathe inside. We spend so much time inside and even more these days, it seems that air needs to be healthy air, safe air. Um, we're looking at supporting advocacy and um, tenants association and really trying to understand and see how um, these things fit together. And one is not possible without the other. Uh, we cannot be sustainable without it being fully inclusive. And then um, adopting formal affordable housing goals that reflect the town's current demographics and needs. And so those are, those are five, I think there's more that we certainly, we could go on and on. There is plenty of action needed, um, but those are the five. And I think the idea now is um, Lauren's gonna put, you have an activity in order to kind of elicit responses to this list, is that right? Yeah, thanks, Jesse. Um, so we'll launch into that now. And I'll just say that Jesse is also here to answer any questions that folks have, or if there are any um, refreshers on um, anything at all. Um, he's also here to, to answer questions and, and help guide the discussion. So um, the first, sort of thing that we wanted to do um, with this set of actions was to ask you all a few questions. And um, looking at this list, what would be the most meaningful outcomes for the plan and why? 
So what would be your top priority on this list? If you could see one thing coming out of the plan, what would it be? And is there something, a key action that you feel like is missing from this list? What surprises you about this list or makes sense to you about this list? Especially after having been through the last two meetings that we've had together. So that's sort of the setup. Um, and the way that we're gonna do it is to have, um, to give everyone three minutes to speak on all of those questions or anything else that comes up for you um, around these actions. And we're gonna give everyone three minutes and I'll keep time. Um, and then if we have extra time left over at the end, we'll open it up to more of a discussion and folks can build off of what each other has been saying. Um, so please raise your hand if you would like to jump in and we'll go around and make sure that everyone has a chance to jump in before we, um, before we take second comments from folks. John, I see you have your hand up. And just don't forget to unmute yourself. Okay. Um, I actually think it's a pretty good list. Um, I can't think of anything right off the top of my head that is not included, although I'm sure if I went back to the minutes of the meetings, I'd find something, but I think that's irrelevant. Um, overall, what I see on the list is things that I know are going on elsewhere. Um, if you look at housing plans for other communities, you will find all of these things on there except number two, um, which I think has to do more with state legislation than local legislation, although it is something that town council could commit itself to. But mostly I think that's a state level issue. Um, I think moving toward all of these things is great. There is a, a working group, the Towns Community Resources Committee that is attempting to create a general housing policy for the town. And all of these things could fit into that. I think the problem becomes is um, all of them have costs associated with them. And that's gonna kind of create issues with town council because there are competing priorities for money. Um, I really can't name a top priority myself I mean, two is sort of easy to say I'm in favor of, as are the others, but two, as I said, I think of more as advocating at the state level. Um, these other issues, if the town wants to do them, the town needs to come up with money or a way of uh, having maybe some tax relief for uh, building owners who for example, would work towards number three. Uh, and again, there may be some way for number one to do some kind of tax relief for people who are willing to engage in changes to their buildings. There are also town buildings that we could begin with. So generally, I like the list. And I think uh, it's a reasonable list for us to be advocating for. Um, before town council and right now specifically before the community resources committee which is working on a general town housing policy great thanks john that's a really great important piece of information to be sharing with the group i also i want to um, press you a little bit if you'll entertain me um, around the notion of prioritizing. You mentioned how there, there are limited funds and there will be a need to prioritize things in order to get them done. So if one of these had to happen first, which one would it be for you? Well, as the chair of the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, I would pick number five. Uh, basically, I think it's extremely important for us to be producing more affordable housing in town. I mean, one of the reasons why renters working with existing landlords have issues is because there's really a scarcity of affordable housing. So mm -hmm. 
if we can move on creating affordable housing uh, productively, I think that would be great. And uh, as I said, my job as a volunteer, as the chair of the housing trust, is to try to see that happen. Um, myself and lots of other people, for example, were advocating for the development of studio apartments at 132 Northampton Road. That's before the ZBA, they're closing in on finishing and I think that they'll end up recommending a comprehensive permit. And that project will be great. It'll probably take another two years before the first tenant walks in the door, but we need to get more projects like that into the pipeline. So from the, my personal bias, I'm gonna choose number five. Great, thanks, John, appreciate it. So who would like to go next? Chris, yeah, go ahead. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Um, I'm Chris Riddle, uh, him, her, um, him, her, him, his. Um, uh, I, um, my, my particular uh, coal celebre that I work on all the time is, is, is the existing building stock. I'm interested in the existing building stock because it is such a huge problem. How do we attack, um, uh, make the existing building stock more energy efficient? It's a particularly important issue in the context of residential housing and people's, the people who are living in the existing residential building stock, private sector residential building stock. I don't know the numbers, but I expect that there, it's a big chunk of the population of the town and it tends to be a, a population that's underrepresented. <clears throat> My feeling is that, so I would vote for number three there. I would say that if I, if I would be my highest priority, figure out a way to um, upgrade the, the existing residential buildings, the public the existing residential multifamily buildings in town and do it in a way that will not, um, uh, that will not cause, make those places, make those um, living units unaffordable to the people that are there. Um, and I think that's, um, uh, I think just think that's a very, very large problem because I don't have the answer to it. I don't know how to do that. I don't know where to even can find um, the, the very large sums of money to both reno renovate those houses and make them, uh, make them uh, well insulated and airtight and then put in a, a air, um, air source heat pump or something like that to heat them and cool them. Uh, it's a huge sum of money and that's what's bothering me. So I, I, I like the list here. I like the goals implicit in this list, but the devil is in the detail of how do we fund it all as John suggested. Um, and I think the uh, figuring out how to do it in the public sector or in the subsidized uh, and partially subsidized sector is uh, I can imagine figuring that out. I don't know how to deal with the existing uh, privately owned uh, building stock that's, uh, that's occupied, paying the bills, and, and the, the, the owners of those buildings see no incentive uh, to invest large sums of money in it. So that's the problem that I care about most. And so I vote for three. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. I Um, I think I froze there for a second, but um, I was just saying, I think you're pointing to a few really important things there um, around sort of the tension between improvements to buildings and gentrification and, and affordability, um, which is definitely a tough nut to crack. And, um, and sort of the idea of aligning incentives for owners to um, to be willing to commit to making those upgrades. So those are really important uh, issues to raise and, and things that we'll have to tackle as a community to make these, these actions work. All right. So folks who haven't jumped in yet, um, I wanna check in with, um, yeah, Jim. Uh, Jeremiah has raised his hand. Great, thank you. I 
can't see the participants list while I'm sharing my screen. So Jeremiah, please go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, um, say that I, I agreed with, oh, I, Jeremiah, uh, he, him, his, sorry. Um, I wanted to agree with uh, Chris and, and I feel that uh, uh, number three seems for, for me, in my opinion, to be a priority. Uh, and, and I think largely it's due to the fact that like, like just sort of echoing uh, what he had said is we have, we have a lot more existing uh, rental properties than we do have new properties going, uh, being, being built. And even, even if it's a smaller residential, uh, and also just looking at number three, I, I almost feel that some of these other items might get cleaned up if, if all of three was in place. So if we, if we had tenants entering into properties that had more thermal comfort, you know, better acoustic separation, better indoor air quality, that say number four, where you have this quality of life, I, that that's that will go up in a lot of ways because these are things that have already been um, addressed um, prior to them crossing the threshold. So I think if we, if we can find a way uh, to um, encourage property owners to to look at all of those those concerns. Um, it, 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 I think that there's going to be this really positive trickle effect um, through the community and, and help with a lot of these other other items. Thanks, Jeremiah. And I'm curious, in your experience, have you seen um, successful examples of that kind of partnership or initiative that has engaged owners in, in prioritizing upgrades and and sort of leading to those ripple effects that you're talking about? Ha, have I had those experiences? Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, I would say in, it, there, the avenues for incentives, I think they're out there, but some of them are becoming a little bit more challenging. Uh, so there is funding, there is funding, and, I, and I'm, I'm I'm sure Stephanie uh, will, will agree that there is funds out there, but some, sometimes get, getting, getting a hold of them is, has become a lot more challenging. If we were to look back uh, five, six or, or more years, uh, they, were, they were just knocking down your door to try to get you to, to uh, take, take some of these, uh, the funds or, or some of these improvements. Um, I, I, I still think, I think that's going to be the, the greatest challenge with, with a lot of that is just acquiring some of these different funds. And, and I don't know, I don't know that everyone out there will know how to get to them, uh, because you do have to sort of navigate a labyrinth of, um, campaigning and, and documentation to, to get to them. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure if I answered any of your questions. I just sort of losing track here. <laughs> no, I think uh, it's, it's a valuable perspective. Um, I, I'm reminded of a conversation I had earlier with, uh, earlier today with a, a member of one of the other task groups, sort of uh, connecting the ideas of of COVID recovery and climate resiliency and where there might be some opportunities there. Um, and sort of to what Jesse was speaking to earlier about um, sort of indoor air quality being so important to health and, and sort of the health of buildings being so important to the health of the people who inhabit them. Are there ways when and when and if hopefully there will be COVID recovery stimulus to use those funds in ways that also have beneficial results for, for climate resiliency and for the quality of life uh, issues that we're talking about here. Um, so that's one thing that's been coming to mind for me. It's, it's not something that we know for sure is gonna happen, but um, there's no doubt that 
as as many folks have pointed to, massive investments will be required, um, regardless. Um, and and we can make those investments in ways that enhance our climate resiliency and our quality of life, or that go back to the way things were. But as we've been saying, going back is not really good enough at this point. So. Um, yeah, and, yeah, and I do agree. I, I know with a lot of this, the uh, different, some projects that I'm looking at, uh, having that availability of funds through the CARES or FEMA has, it really should be used as this springboard to take care of a lot of these, these items. Uh, and I, I'm doing my best and throwing as much stuff as, as possible at, at uh, uh, Sean, our, our CFO, uh, to see if, if I can get past. We, we, we might be looking at these smaller efforts because there's, there's always opportunities to make smaller efforts to make buildings more energy efficient. But mm -hmm. having this, this other pool, um, it really is, is a great opportunity. And, and I, I am doing what I can um, with some success. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to hear that. And thanks for sharing. All right, we haven't heard from Georgia, from Lydia, from Chris Brestrup. Um, please feel free to raise your hand and share any thoughts you might have about this list. Or right, Georgia, since you're off video, feel free to just unmute and jump in. Lydia, yeah, did you want to go ahead? I could go ahead. Sure, thanks. Um, well, I'm going to jump on my soapbox and uh, talk about a couple of things uh, that are a little off, slightly off, tar off this list. But I actually think that Amherst should declare a climate emergency. There have been a lot of cities around the world, including New York City, other major cities in the United States that have done this. And I think that would help people understand um, that we may need to do things that we've never done before, that we haven't even said we were gonna do before. Um, we are living through a time with COVID where the government, the town, the state and the federal government are all doing, making people do things for our own good. And I think that, that that's gonna need to happen around climate. Um, so uh, that's my soapbox. My other soapbox is that um, I think we should scrap the library project uh, in terms of expanding our library and those money should be available to retrofit, to be loans for people um, who wanna upgrade their apartments as well as their homes that they own. Um, I think that the Mass Save program, um, there's so much potential there for both for renters that's not being tapped into. There's there's things for buildings mm -hmm. that have four apartments or or fewer um, that can be tapped in. There's um, there's a program for for buildings that have more than uh, for apartments, and that we could uh, find out from MassSave how many buildings in our town have been evaluated, how many have been retrofitted, and kind of set some um, prior set some goals for what percentage each year would be uh, use those services. And um, I also think that the town could set up. Uh, a resource center for both homeowners and renters. It could may possibly be at the library where people could come in and find out what they're eligible for, how to do things themselves in the, in the places where they live. Uh, I think maybe um, the, some of the CPA money could be used to um, develop that center. Um, Let's and for see. those folks um, who, who aren't familiar, um, I just wanted to add that CPA is Community Preservation Act. Right. Uh, and maybe the let's see, for CRA, it. maybe CRA, is that another one? Yeah. But that, um, mm. um, that, you know, prioritizing money where we spend money is going to be a difficult 
certainly a difficult thing, but I think um, having no interest loans available for people, having uh, people's ability to use their property, increase their property taxes by borrowing from the town to do renovations that will over time save them money could be a good plan. Um, yeah. Um, all this while, you know, we're working on our municipal buildings. You know, I think, you know, this list, this is a great list and everything needs to happen. I think um, renters, I'm a former social worker for many years. And uh, so I, I know that renters' rights are really important, but I also think that if we started doing things for mandated for rental housing, there would be fewer problems in, in people renting. Um, Let's see. I don't know. That's probably been three minutes. I don't know if anybody's timing. Um, yeah, you're okay though. Okay. Um, maybe we need to fundraise by making people have a sticker for their car that so everybody with a car would have to pay some more money besides the tax they already pay. Um, maybe that would decrease the number of cars in town. Maybe not, but would generate some money. Maybe we need a tax on um, trash, some other things that where we could generate money for um, for buildings. Um, I appreciate that sort of systemic thinking about how to encourage the kinds of things that we do want and discourage the kinds of things that we don't want at the same time. And that's actually um, uh, one of our task groups. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. appreciate that. I also um, wanted to, to pick up on a couple of things that you said there related mm -hmm. to sort of the mass save incentives. And um, so that's a state run program that our utility run program really that um, provides incentives for folks to upgrade their, um, their units, um, energy efficiency, sort of programmable thermostats, different things like that. Um, and one of the things that we've uh, heard in many of the other groups is that sometimes the barrier to action in that sphere with the larger apartment complexes is really getting the owners and property managers on board and, and working with those folks to, um, to get the buy-in needed to actually take those steps. And so what I'm hearing you say is that <laughs> rather that it, it can be coming from both sides. It can be tenant advocacy and it can be mandated requirements that sort of work together to, to encourage the kinds of things that we're going for. Yeah, I know that in Boulder, Colorado, it's mandated to use the state pro programs, um, the town, you know, somehow the city thinks that they can force people to do that and, and, and are, and it's working. Well, that's a really so, good precedent yeah. to point to. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, the other thing I, I wanted to pick up on was you mentioned sort of this idea of property assessed upgrades, like having a way of financing upgrades by adding them to property taxes and sort of in that way, taking out a, a loan from the town um, mm -hmm. that you repay over time. Um, and that's certainly another sort of innovative funding mechanism that, that several municipalities in Massachusetts have adopted and, and a precedent that could be pretty useful in Amherst. So yeah. definitely an important one to add to that list. I think you could make it so that it passes along with the mortgage. So, I mean, people, mm. so people aren't afraid of doing it, mm. that it would just be a part of the, the, the deed or what, I don't know, you know, the next yeah. person would have to keep paying for the improvements on the property. Right. Uh, and that, you know, that there are poor people in town that own their homes, too. You know, it's not just people renting. There are elderly people. There are people who, you know, are living on the edge that actually right. own their homes also. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Lydia. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I see Christine has her hand raised, and then we can go to Georgia. Hi, I'm Chris Brestrup, um, planning director, and I use um, she, her, hers. 
pronouns. Um, so I, I really strongly um, hover around um, item number three and item number five. I think item number three is really important, but um, helping people with rental housing, I've been a renter in the past and I know how um, difficult it is if you have a unit that isn't um, well insulated and you have to pay a lot of money for um, heating. Um, it's in the past, Amherst had a program where they helped people. I don't know if they helped renters, but they helped homeowners to um, make improvements in their homes. And I believe it was um, a federal government program where the town had some money available and then they made loans to people to make um, improvements to their homes. So that's it's possible that we could do something like that through the community development block grant um, program. <laughs> but one thing that happens whenever you do something like that is that it's not only the money that you have to um, find and then you know figure out how to get it out to people, but there's also a cost to um, the town to support staff to work on these programs. So we would have to get a commitment from the town, not only to um, somehow find the money to do this, but also <coughs> to commit money from uh, to support staff to do it. Excuse me, I'm gonna, I'm coughing. No problem. So very aligned with our group agreements to take the care that you need to, to be able to be fully here. So the other thing I wanted to do is support John um, Hornick in his promotion of item five, which I think is very important for the town. And we <coughs> run into problems with this a lot. The town actually does a lot to promote affordable housing. And we're always looking for ways to um, build affordable housing. The town has been very instrumental in getting this um, project at 132 Northampton Road off the ground and working with Valley CDC to help them get that approved by the, um, by the ZBA. Um, <coughs> but we ran into some issues with people in town uh, who say, well, you know what, um, how many affordable units do we need? You know, um, do we really need to keep building affordable units even though we have over 10% affordable already? Um, some people view having over 10% affordable housing units as a way of fending off developers who might come in and propose what we call unfriendly 40Bs, which are unfriendly projects that include affordable units, but really um, often benefit the developers very much. So anyway, we're constantly struggling to figure out where to build affordable housing and how to partner with um, developers to do this. And um, having some goals, I think, would be a really good idea because 10%, well, you know, we're better than most communities in Massachusetts. We actually got an award a couple of years ago for our efforts with regard to building affordable housing, but it's really not um, enough to, to meet our needs. So what goals should we have? And it's really unclear. Um, to us in the planning department. Um, I'm, I, I'm not sure if it's clear to people in the Housing Trust or if they have an idea of what our goals should be. But um, working on that idea and then talking about how much town resources are we going to put towards making this goal a reality. And, um, you know, if we're really serious about creating affordable housing, we have to, we have to put some money towards it. The town is actually pretty good at doing that. They did put... Um, I think $750,000 into the development of the 132 Northampton Road project. They also put $2 million, $2 million in tax incentive for the Beacon project in North Amherst um, over a 10 year period. But there's, there's probably a lot more that we could do, but I think working on um, you know, what, what kind of a goal should we have for providing affordable housing for, um, for the people who live here? So that's, Thanks, that's all I have to say right now. I really, really appreciate that, um, that perspective. And I, I would even um, maybe add to that 
sort of going back to what Georgia was speaking to earlier, that in the process of developing those goals, bringing and, and sort of to our homework uh, responses earlier that I know you weren't um, part of the last meeting, but that you heard some of the, our uh, group members reflections on is the idea of um, making sure that renters are included in the process of setting those goals um, and, and brown and, and black folks in the community are included in setting those goals um, to make sure that the needs are communicated clearly and the goals that are set do reflect those needs. Um, so I really appreciate the, um, the sort of clear framing of how those goals could be used to further develop more affordable housing in Amherst. So I wanted to check in with Georgia. I think um, you're the only one we haven't heard from yet. And if you wanna jump in and add your thoughts, please feel free. Yeah, I mean, I would just, um, I think it's a great list. I, I really think it's, um, it covers quite a bit. I mean, my idea would just probably be to arrange the order, right? I mean, I believe in number four, for example, for me, it should be number one, where people become this idea of a creation of a tenants association, you know, teaching people, you know, having them learn what some of their rights are, you know, what this committee is about or what you know is being advocated but really empowering them with the information um so like for me it's really just how it's arranged and number two would be probably the, the um, legislation part because i mean amherst is ripe right there's a lot of investors and i mean they're not going to be committed to because it means money <laughs> you know um, to doing some of the things um, here, right? To uh, looking at energy efficiency, renovations and all that stuff. Um, it's like people sometimes have to be, you know, legislation as policies have to drive those changes. So for me, like number, like I said, um, four would be number one, two is number two. Number five for me would be number three. It's like, you know, um, then that's a goal of the town. Um, number four, number three would become number four and number one with number five, because I think, you know, at the end of the day, it's about the bottom line and, you know, um, people are not going to take very kindly, you know, they're going to look at their taxes, you know, going up or, you know, people are not going to want to invest more money in these things, which in the long run are going to be beneficial. So I think um the renters i like the idea of a renters association and an advocacy you know group coming out of that organically and then you know driving legislation that makes that requirement i mean the reality mm -hmm. is the investors are that are coming to amherst a lot of them aren't even from this area they're from other states i mean mm -hmm. i think that new building that it's not in amherst it's in sunderland that has a hundred and whatever units those guys are out of Texas. Really? Wow. So, I mean, if they're coming into Amherst, then maybe they should be the one, you know, there, there should be a requirement that if they're going to be built, you know, what are kind of the buildings that they have to build, or maybe they're required to put money, you know, I'm not sure some mm -hmm. tax, whatever it is. Right. But yeah. um, I just feel that you know, someone mentioned about the library again, it's about, you know, the power structure, right? I mean, the renters don't really have the voice. Their voices are not amplified. So it's where the power lies. And I mean, you know, having the library and the resources is important for the certain population mm -hmm. in Amherst. So again, who is driving the conversation? Who is driving mm -hmm. the decisions behind what the budget looks like. It's the people that have the power. You know, they're the ones that's really ultimately deciding, you know, where the money's gonna be spent. Yeah. So, yeah. So it, it sounds like, Georgia, you're saying that there's just, there's a need to 
redistribute some of that power into the hands mm-hmm. of, of folks who are being most impacted and the least heard. Absolutely. And just, you know, people don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, there's just a lot of um, information and people really, they have no idea what their rights are. You know, they're moving into some of these buildings with young children and they're basically signing that there's a possibility that they might be let in the building. But for them, it's just really and truly having, needing a roof over their head. So they don't have a choice to say, you know what, I don't want to live here. I want to find somewhere else to live. You know, that I know that my child is safe. I have a five-year-old and... I don't know if I want to expose him to the possibility of lead because this building is 100 years old or whatever it Mm -hmm. is. So people are very limited in their options. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's about taking care of their immediate needs. And they don't have the resources. They don't have access to some of the resources. And they just have to do what they have to do in order to, to, to basically stay safe, have a roof over their head, provide housing for their families. So it's really to take some of that power back. And, you know, um, yeah. And that's a piece of of resilience to climate change. How can you, how can you think about climate change when, you know, your first concern is, is having a roof over your head? It's exactly, these things are really, really related. Mm hmm. Thanks a lot, Georgia. Okay. Um, I think we have uh, another guest from the MVP program, Andrew, that was going to share. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, Hi, Andrew. Welcome. Visible. Yeah. So everything sounds okay. Is it is it working out? I'm uh, I'm audible on everything. I just want to confirm that. Yes. Yeah, no. we can hear you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, one of the things. Um, that might be worth considering, you don't have to, is um, long-term considerations when it comes to uh, the fact that you're used to dealing with uh, high population turnover on an annual basis under normal times. And um, what would it mean in a climate migration uh, situation, right? So um, fast forward 10, 20, 30 years, um, and a lot of people's real estate values are plummeting in, in coastal areas. Not to be like super depressing, but it's kind of part of the re- reality that we're faced with. Like, um, what does it what does it mean um, for a town to have plans for people to live there, and then all of a sudden people come? Uh, are you going to be welcoming? Are you going to be welcoming to some people? Are you going to be welcoming to everybody? I mean, obviously the goal is to be welcoming to everybody. And I'm just wondering, like, what policies can be included now? Um, in anticipation of migration trends. And that's more of a thought rather than a, a comment. And you can take it or leave it. Thanks, Andrew. Did you have other thoughts you wanted to share or was that the main main one? No, no that's it. You know, it's just a lot of, um, you know, the built environment will be, I mean, I have my own ideas about how to accommodate that, but um, I think it's just, it's not my real real place to say um, what would work for Amherst, but it's just a, an interesting thing to consider. And I think um, I think the goal would be to um, one of the, one of the one of the things I frequently hear from MVP uh, workshops in areas that have uh, that are land rich and uh, not not to include Amherst in this category because it's a developed community. But um, sometimes people will get to the point of thinking about uh, migration and their first thought is, well, we don't want that to happen and how can we stop it? And I just think maybe a community like Amherst uh, would have a, a more progressive thought process around that. And it might be a good example, especially in this in this uh, adaptation planning process to have some consideration to that um, in a thoughtful, compassionate way. Yeah, you, you actually point to um, a few of the sort of values that we've pulled out from the very beginning of this process around empathy and compassion for our fellow um, residents and, and fellow townspeople. Um, and yeah, I really appreciate you planting that seed. That's certainly not a topic that we've delved into in any depth yet in this group, but I think um, something for folks to sort of 
cogitate on and um, continue to integrate into their thinking about these strategies. So really appreciate that. Thanks, Andrew. So it's just about time for us to move on to the next part of our meeting. Um, we're going to be wrapping up around eight. John, I see you have a hand up. Did you yeah, I wanted to comment on some of the things other people have said. Um, fundamentally, all of these things require money, um, almost except number four, which requires a relatively small amount of money that could be 100% town money. Everything else, the town will put in money, but it's going to be relatively small. For example, if you take affordable housing, the town puts in maybe 10% of the cost of an affordable housing development. The rest of it comes through mechanisms designed and created by the State Department of Housing and Community Development. Similarly, um, Lydia was talking about the mass save programs, which would come under number three. There are probably other things that the state supports. Um, there certainly have been in the past. Um, and uh, I think Jeremiah mentioned the use of CARES money that might come there. So I think we need to be able to leverage those kinds of funds to do that and certainly to do number one. And uh, I think two is really a question of advocacy for resources, for money, to be able to do the remaining things that we have on the list. Um, so I think it might help if the consultants could, under each of these, one, two, three, four, and five, list where money is going to be found to be able to finance these things so that we can advocate for that money or advocate for more money, because that's going to be critical to uh, all of them, as I said, except four. There's probably no outside funding for that unless we went to like a foundation um, other than that, the town has to put up the money. Thank you, John. Yeah, absolutely. I think funding is a, a critical theme that has come up throughout this conversation and something that um, us as consultants, along with the Climate Action Committee, um, have been thinking about in terms of how we can build in that kind of thinking into the implementation for the plan. Um, so definitely, uh, something that's on our radar and something that I hope that this group will continue to push and, um, and support. And um, I just wanted to check, um, Chris, did you have your hand up or was that from before? No, I just wanted to say um, in line with what John was just saying that um, the town has a limited budget and um, especially now because of COVID-19, our budget has been strained and we understand that um, next year may be even more strained. So there are gonna to have to be trade-offs. And I think, you know, Lydia was getting at one of those trade-offs. Um, not saying I would necessarily agree with what Lydia said, but she's right on the fact that you can't have everything, you know, if you wanna have new buildings, then maybe you're not going to be able to put as much money into the things that are on this list here. So we have to get serious about setting our priorities and, and deciding where do we want to spend our money because there's a limited amount. So that's all I really wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's really important. And that's also true for climate change. Um, and so prioritization is is sort of an integral part of this process as a result of that recognition. And so very much appreciate that comment. Uh, I am gonna move us on to the next part of our conversation. I know you have your hand raised, Chris, but hopefully you'll be able to um, share that thought in the next section. Um, and so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so we can all see each other for this next part. So um, for the, the next sort of half hour of our meeting, um, we wanted to do a bit of reflecting about this process overall. Um, we've heard from many of you and many other participants in the other task groups that this process has felt a little different from other um, municipal 
planning processes. And um, we wanna hear from you all about what that has meant. So here are the questions. We're gonna do the same thing as this last round where we'll give everyone three minutes. Well, we're like five minutes behind schedule. I, I will keep everyone to that three minutes. Um, so did you think that this was a worthwhile process? If yes, what made it worthwhile? What made it special? If no, what, what made it not work? And what could make it better in the future? Um, so I'll give everyone a, a second to think on that and sort of think about the last two and a half meetings and the conversations we've been having and what that's meant. And we'll do the same thing as last time. So whenever folks feel ready, feel free to raise your hand or if you're off video to unmute yourself. Yeah, Chris, go ahead. And then we'll go to Jeremiah. Um, let's see. Uh, I will confess that I have came into the process with a, a technical orientation on, on climate change. I, I'm interested in finding a way to actually get to uh, uh, negative greenhouse gas emissions in 2050. And, and there's a lot, there is an, an abundant um, uh, supply of, of technical ways to attack that problem, non-people ways of attack, attacking that problem. Being part of this group has raised my consciousness there. You know, we've got to, uh, it, it, is, it is not just a technical problem, it's a people problem and it's both. And I, I don't wanna minimize the, the importance and the challenges of, the, of how do we actually, if we didn't have any people involved, if we just had to get these buildings, uh, get everything get everything up to where we have negative uh, greenhouse gas emissions in 2050, that's a pretty amazing challenge all by itself. But it's important that we, uh, we realize who, why we're doing this and who we're doing it for. Um, so in that sense, so I've, I've had, I wanna thank the group for sort of helping me uh, move forward on that consciousness. It's probably one reason why I chose three rather than one. It doesn't make any difference as far as the climate's concerned. If we, if we can make, make uh, uh, commercial buildings uh, be more efficient and uh, use less energy, that's as far as the climate's concerned, that's fine. Or we could do that, we could make residential um, multifamily housing more efficient, has the same effect. So, it's both, so obviously the answer is, well, multifamily housing, that's what we should be concentrating on. I have this idea that I think what we, I would like us to try to, I have to say, I, I would like, a, a, just because it's so hard to get people to concentrate on unglorious things like fixing up apartment buildings you know, that are already there and they already have their finishes in them and they already have people in them. It's hard to, that's a, a un, it's an unglorious, um, project in contrast to a shiny new material building, say for instance. Um, and so, and I think it's, it's a, and the dimensions of that problem are so huge that and nobody is really willing to face up to that. Anyway, I wanna work on, say, on, on private sector, privately owned multifamily uh, apartment projects and figure out a way to attack those because I think that's the most important problem. I have an idea that if we could find ourselves a private sector developer in, the, in Amherst who was willing to do a little bit of, 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 spend a little bit of money and to take a small chunk, let's say one building at one of the complexes and, and, and renovate that building, and do, do a proper deep energy retrofit and put in the heat pumps and do all the things we want to do in the hot water heaters and then figure out really what that costs and what is it and how much of an advantage that developer will have uh, in, the, so that in finding tenants in that new, newly renovated place. It might be good to show a, a case study of a, of a project that's viable right here in town that we could have start getting the developers to talk to the developers, realizing there is a value there. 
especially if we can find some kind of subsidy somehow. Anyway, that's an idea. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I really just want to acknowledge um, something you said early on there about the, you know, the magnitude of the technical challenge, but also the technical challenge sort of being moot if we if we don't keep in mind who we're doing it for and and why we're doing it. It's a really um, wonderful reflection. Thank you. So um, I think we said we were going to go to Jeremiah next. Yes, thank you. I'd uh, probably be relatively brief. Um, this, unfortunately, I this is my my uh, first meeting that I've been able to attend. Um, but I have. That's all right, all we're glad material. to have you. Yeah, I, I have been keeping up and looking at the material. Um, okay. First, I I do like to I do appreciate um, what what you said, uh, Chris, early on, and. Uh, and coming from a sort of a mechanical background, uh, a, 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 an empty building with all its systems running has no complaints. Um, <laughs> but when we bring in a, a human element is, is when we start running into a lot of challenges. Um, uh, setting that aside though, I, I think that anything that we can do, it, it's a series of a lot of small efforts and I think for people to understand that, that these efforts are ongoing. Uh, e even if you were to look at some of these new developers building brand new buildings, state of the art with all the best stuff, fast forward five years and they need to do something else. And, and that's just the reality of it. So I think that it's so important to keep this conversation alive, that, that it needs to continue on. Um, be, because of that reason, um, even if you have this, this goal that is 10 or 20 years out, it, it can't stop there. When you get there, you have to push forward again, uh, because just, just like any aged building, you can replace something. As soon as you replace something, every year it, it's degrading. It's, it's getting less efficient. So you have to do it again and then again and then again. It's a never ending process. So it really does. I, th I think, I guess the, the machine that needs to change is us. I mean, we're, we're the ones that, we, that need to change. It's our behaviors. Um, and if we change our behaviors, then all of the technical and mechanicals stuff uh, will change with us. Um, so I just wanted to say that it's, it's, this conversation is so important and it needs to continue. Thanks for that, Jeremiah. I think what you were saying also reminded me of a, another conversation for, with another task group member around this idea that we recognize what Chris was saying about sort of the massive investment required. We need to think of it as an investment in our future and, and building better buildings means that those investments carry us further and and serve us better in the meantime. Um, and so sort of shifting from this mindset of this is a huge cost to this is a huge investment, I think is part of changing that the behavior that you're talking about. Um, so thank you. Wanna let anyone jump in? Sarah and Stephanie as well, please feel free. I know you've both You've both been part of all of these meetings. I'm sure you have uh, lots of reflections on the process. Uh, well, I'll jump in. John, sure, uh, yeah. Uh, since nobody else is. Um, I, honestly, I was not sure where this was going. I felt like the earlier meetings were drifting. Um, you know, there was a lot of different things discussed, but I like the fact that you pulled together those discussions with these key ideas and major actions. I think that's a really good step. And now we need to take some more steps. Um, we can't take this to people without being able to talk about how we're gonna pay for it. And I know I mentioned that before, but I think that's a really important next step for us with each of these key ideas or major actions. We need to have a path to be able to finance it. And as Chris said earlier, it can't all rely on town money. The money just isn't there. 
Uh, we have to figure out how to best leverage town money by using other resources. Uh, the other thing I want to go back to, which I think is as important as finding a way to finance all of this, is what Chris said, and that is we have a people problem. I don't know exactly what Chris meant by that, but I'll tell you what I think about that. I think people for various reasons are going to be resistant to these ideas. And that means we have to explain them and advocate for them. And again, it's like financing. If we don't have a path for doing that, uh, it doesn't matter how good these ideas or whether we can find money to pay for them, people aren't gonna accept them unless we understand where the areas of resistance are and we're prepared to address those issues, uh, really attack people in a sense uh, in order to change their minds and get them on board and make them understand that, as Lydia said, we're, we're in an emergency. And if we don't act now, we're gonna be in trouble in five years or certainly 10 years or 20 years. Thanks, John. I, yeah, I, um, I really like what you said about sort of the need to address that resistance with explaining and advocating. And I would add to that as well, empowering along, again, George's, uh, the lines of George's comment earlier, empowering more people to get into the conversation and to keep it going and, and to be advocates and, and, and do that explaining, have that, the knowledge and the information needed to, to build the movement. Um, so really appreciate that too, thanks. Lydia, Christine, Georgia, Andrew, Stephanie. Please, yeah, go ahead, Stephanie. Sure. Um, so I guess for me in sort of thinking about this process and it's funny, I, I think I heard Chris's comment about it being a people problem in a little bit of a different way. I was hearing it more as we're so focused on the technical but we forget about the people that are impacted by the technology and, and the, the costs of the technology and how some people, uh, there are barriers for people that we don't often see when we're looking at just the technolo technological piece. And I think that's in part for me why wanting to do this whole process in a different way was so important because it was important to bring people's voices to looking at this work and not just focus on just the mechanics of it and the technical aspects of it, but the ways in which um, there just has to be a cultural shift. You know, we just have to sort of have an intense, extreme sort of cultural shift in our thinking about um, other people. And that when we think about some of these comforts, you know, when I think about people's homes and their comforts and, you know, the prior, trying to make priorities, where do we, where do we actually benefit the most, uh, the most people within the community versus the one, um, you know, the one maybe particular building renovation, I guess, to the point of the library. And I'm not saying that I, I'm advocating that we don't do the library work um, because I think there's a lot of benefit to having a public library for people. Um, but uh, but at the same time, you know, maybe there's other buildings where we're sort of looking at these sort of comfort things, but, you know, could that money be used in a different way for, you know, for the housing complexes or a housing complex that benefits more people, you know? Um, and maybe that doesn't bring emissions down as much as the other. Like, so I guess it's just for me, it's a trade off. It's like not just about the emissions, but also about the people, too. Um, that's so that's just kind of the all of those thoughts that are going around in my head. Appreciate those reflections, Stephanie. It's definitely, yeah, lots to wrestle with. Uh, yeah, Christine. So one thing I've been thinking about, and I don't know how to resolve 
of this is the fact that a lot of the new buildings that are built in town are really highly energy efficient. In fact, people who live there, um, well, they don't pay through their utilities, except maybe cable and telephone. Um, they don't have to pay for their heat and hot water because it's paid for by the landlords, but the landlords are building those buildings so in such a fashion that the landlords aren't really suffering as a result of paying for the heat and hot water for their tenants. And yet, mm -hmm. you know, those buildings are really expensive to live in. So how can you combine, you know, the comfort level and the energy efficiency and all of that with um, a building that, you know, is that can house people who don't make a lot of money, who don't have a lot of money to spend on housing. So I think that's, that's a challenge. And actually the 132 Northampton Road project is doing a really good job with that. They're um, highly energy efficient. They have figured out a way of making that building really tight and really um, it's not going to be um, difficult to heat it and to have hot water for the tenants there. So I guess the techniques are evolving and I hope that um, new housing that's built in the future follows that same pattern. It's hard to go back and try to retrofit the older buildings. Um, and so I, I don't know what to say about that, except to look to Chris Riddle to try to solve that puzzle. But <laughs> I just wanted to say that with enough money, you can make a building really energy efficient. Yeah, it's a good and important thing to acknowledge for sure. And, and to sort of um, think about how that prioritization works um, to Stephanie's point. And yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. I can share. Hey. Yeah, clip. please, Sarah. Um, so Jesse lost internet, and mm. I asked him if he had a reflection he wanted to share. Um, and his was the same as mine, and it was that uh, um, less about the content, but just the spirit of the the honesty and transparency of the conversation that people have showed up with. Um, I really didn't want to do this on Zoom, so I've been pleasantly surprised at the richness of the conversation. And we're both just deeply grateful um, to everyone that's showed up over the course of the last few months. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. And thanks for relaying that message from Jesse as well. We were wondering where he had gone and I'm sorry to hear he lost internet, but I'm glad that he's still with us in spirit. <laughs> Via my phone. <laughs> awesome. Awesome, awesome. So I think we have not heard from Georgia and Lydia. If Georgia, you want to go next? Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I really don't have much to say. I just think it's um, it's a great initiative. But of course, um, you know, we know that money will always be a hurdle. Um, and again, I just really always encourage having different voices at the table just getting different perspectives because sometimes you just never know. Um, people can be really creative <laughs> and um, find options that you would never imagine. Mm -hmm. And I'm really, mm -hmm. I always go back to this TED talk by Melody Hobson, where she says that, you know, they could not find a cure for the smallpox. And the cure came from a most unlikely source. It came from a dairy farmer who noticed that the milkmaids we're not getting the, the, the um getting the smallpox, and that's and that the, the, the cure to that came from is um bovine based. So I just you know what I'm saying it's like all these scientists couldn't figure it out, but this dairy farmer noticed. So just to you know that's just to say that um you know just have different perspectives, just have different lens, because um I think you know just having those conversations, just having that transparency, that inclusivity is important in just really getting um, people's perspectives because sometimes um, you'd be surprised at what it um, it brings and it uncovers. Totally, Georgia. I really um, resonate with that. I was having a conversation with another task group member earlier today and she said something very similar um, along those lines of sort of 
sometimes the assumptions that you make about how people might prioritize different things or um, the, the solutions that they might come up with are not right. Sometimes you, you have to have those conversations to find out and, and what you find out might surprise you. Um, and so just to echo Sarah, you know, having everyone here and, and willing to spend their time with us on a late on a Thursday or, you know, we've had meetings at all kinds of times so far in this process is just, it's been a real honor. So thank you. Lydia. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I would say I was extremely frustrated at the first meeting uh, that there were no introductions. Um, there was a talk about how relation, this is about relationships and relationships are important and put those first, but there was no way to even, I think on Zoom you can develop relationships. So I would encourage the consultants to um, think about that for the next time they do this with the town or, or whatever. Um, and, uh, but I, you know, I think over town, over time, we've gotten to see each other a little bit and, and hear a little bit about what people do in their lives or why they came to this, this committee. But anyway, um, and Lauren, I think you're doing a great job of kind of summarizing and pulling things together this, this time. Um, I think the, what I've gotten out of this is the real need for tenant organizing and that, that needs, that's separate from the task that the ECAC has of writing policy for the town and a plan uh, that covers all these different areas of you know, transportation and everything. But I think that, I hope that these messages can be brought to um, whoever's gonna decide how to use that $80,000 um, to the town council, um, maybe to some of the groups um, that have the advocacy groups um, to see, you know, kind of what the next step is in terms of tenant organizing in town. Um, and, uh, yeah, I was shocked that there were only three meetings, um, and, uh, that we were going to come up with a, something in, you know, in six hours of work together. Um, but, uh, trust that the, you know, the climate committee is going to be able to take, take whatever we've brought to them and make something happen out of it. Um, I really, uh, I, I do appreciate more community input from uh, low income and people of color. Um, and uh, I hope that we can, you know, figure out how to get, um, people appointed to committees and of the, of the town um, that are more representative of the town. I also wanna do a little commercial for something that happened last weekend uh, because we were doing the acknowledgement of the land that we live on. There was a very wonderful uh, several hour presentation um, locally about the history of Native Americans on this part of the country and it's a YouTube video now called 400, 400 years truth and healing for the next seven generations or something like that. Excellent uh, native led presentation. You know, you can just watch it on YouTube. Um, anyway, that's all. Um, thank you for sharing that Lydia, that's really yeah. great. Yeah. And Lauren, I just wanted to say that I totally, um, what Lydia said, I was actually going to say that is, um, you know, I'm just one person, right? And um, I'm not speaking for an entire community. And really and truly, it's so, so important to get different voices, more people involved in really finding out, you know? I mean, people are doing their best to come up with this, like, list, you know? But, mm -hmm. you know, yes, and, and it's intended, that's the idea behind it. Is that what they want? What's the priority to them? Is it to upgrade their apartments that they're living in now versus building, you know? So just really try figure out a way to in, incorporate the voices of the people who the decisions are being made for, you know, I yeah. think is important. 
Yeah, that's definitely been a resounding theme um, throughout this process. And thank you for echoing it, Georgia. Um, I also just wanted to acknowledge Lydia's comment um, around a desire for introductions. And I, I really appreciate that feedback. And I also really appreciate sort of the, the feeling behind it of, of a desire for that relationship building. Um, and my hope is that in spite of that lack of an initial introduction, that there is still a sense that folks have, have gotten to know each other a bit and that this conversation will continue. Um, especially uh, as you mentioned around the tenant organizing because that's another theme that's come up throughout the task groups and in different settings, um, not just with buildings and is something that there seems to be a lot of energy behind. Um, so, so just um, when we follow up um, the, the notes from this meeting, we're also planning to share notes from the other meetings so that folks can get a sense of what the conversations have been in some of the other groups and, and look for those connections and look for those shared interests or shared passions and, and find, um, find pathways to building those relationships even further. So really appreciate that comment. Um, so, I have a question. Um, sure, John, yeah. Lydia's comment led me to believe that this is our last meeting, which I didn't realize. It is for now, yes. So I was just about to launch into a little spiel about our next steps, um, and I'm happy to speak to that. But did you have more to that question? Well, there's more we can do, more we should talk about from my point of view. Um, you know, if basically I'm not objecting to the key ideas of major actions, but I think there's more that needs to be included in that. And as far as I'm concerned, we're not done. So I'm a little surprised. That's it. John, you and I can keep working on these things together. Exactly. I was just gonna say, I think Lauren just froze. So um, I was just gonna say that, um, I think, you know, um, we sort of had to have a finite set of meetings because we only have so much grant funding <laughs> for uh, having Linnaean um, facilitate uh, so wonderfully as they have so far. And it's not that the process completely ends here or that there aren't other opportunities to, um, to add more feedback because what they're tasked with is to, create a draft climate action adaptation and resiliency plan, uh, working with the ECAC and taking all of the feedback from all of the meetings. And so there'll be an opportunity to come back together um, to sort of look at that draft plan. But I do think your points, John, um, have been really important in this process and that they have raised a lot of issues that, you know, people are hearing that might not have otherwise um, had as much uh, had as much focus on, and I think you know there's been a lot that's come from the conversation, and I think you know, like you said, there's there's so much more to talk about, um, and I think that's probably true for all of the task groups. Quite honestly, you know, all of these things that we're talking about, you know, transportation, land use, um, you know, renewable energy and energy use. There's so much more. So I agree with you, and I think. Um, I think part of this is also an opportunity to, um, and I know we haven't had a lot of time, but you know, Chris is here, Jeremiah is here, I'm here, you know, people that work in town hall, uh, you have members of the ECAC, you know, we we want to have more dialogue, we want to have more interaction, we want more community involvement and engagement, so we welcome that. <clears throat> um. So, uh, so I noticed that Lauren has just come back in, which is great, and she can uh, wrap up this process. Um, this is Jim Newman. Uh, I work for Linan Solutions. I uh, use he, him, his pronouns. Um, I haven't really said anything tonight, uh, um, but I just wanted to say one quick thing, which is that uh, while uh, this meeting process has uh, been pretty focused. We had three meetings. Um, those three meetings have been highly productive, uh, probably way more productive than everybody expected. 
Um, and this is not the end of a process. Uh, Lauren will describe sort of the steps we take, but the material will come back to everybody and have an opportunity uh, to get, uh, to add depth, to add information, to add thought as we move forward through actually crafting this into a plan for uh, the town. Lauren, why don't you jump back in? Sure, thanks Jim, and apologies to all for my crappy internet connection. Um, I'm gonna stay off video for this piece just lest I be kicked off again. Um, but just wanted to um, speak a little bit to the next steps in the process. So after this third round of task group meetings concludes, which this is actually our last meeting of this third round, um, we'll be working on developing a, a comprehensive list of strategies based on these discussions as well as research and conversations with the Energy and Climate Action Committee, with town staff, and with other stakeholders who have not been able to be involved in this process yet, um, but are important to include. Then our plan is to connect back with this group of community leaders and their friends and families in ways that really work um, for you <laughs> to gather your feedback and um, figure out how to make the strategies that we've come up with work. The dialogue will really be ongoing over the next several months, even though we won't be meeting on a regular basis, um, and that everyone here will continue to be engaged with the plan. So we'll be presenting a draft plan to the ECAC, the Energy and Climate Action Committee, toward the end of February. And from there, we'll, and that will be at a, a public ECAC meeting um, that we can let everyone know about. So that's another opportunity to um, jump in with the draft plan. And then the ECAC will provide feedback. We'll present a draft plan to the town in the spring. And that will be another bigger public meeting um, and an opportunity for, again, for folks to um, participate in shaping the plan's content before it's finalized. Um, in the meantime, we, we, and I say we to include myself, Jim, Sarah and Jesse, Stephanie and Gazit Chaya, even though they weren't able to be here tonight, we would all love to hear from you. If you have any thoughts, any lingering questions, any ideas, any case studies, examples of things that you've seen in other communities that have worked really well, anything and everything, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we will be following up on this meeting with notes. And as I mentioned earlier, notes from the other groups as well, so that if you want to dig deeper into what's been going on in some of the other group discussions and find those connections, that becomes more possible. And um, yeah, just wanna thank you all for spending this time with us for devoting the energy and um, for being present to these conversations. It's, it's been really just rich and uh, rewarding, I think, for, for the organization. And we really appreciate your time and your uh, passion for your community. So um, yeah, thanks so much. And it's 7.59, so we did it. <laughs> Um, I hope you all have a you wonderful did. I want to thank everyone, but I also want to point out. Sorry, go sorry, ahead, Lauren. Sorry. I just wanted to point out that if people are really interested too, you can watch the videos from the other task groups. Um, at the beginning of this meeting, I mentioned that they're available on YouTube. So mm -hmm. if you enter ECAC um, and task groups, probably without, you know, land use or buildings, all of them will come up. So um, if you're so inclined, you're welcome to watch, you know, the process for the other groups as well. Thanks, Stephanie. That's a very good note. Um, I have a, question, a very quick question. You, yeah, go for it, Chris. You said that you would produce a plan in February, and then what was the, when was the final? When you said plan, were you saying climate action plan? Yeah, Climate Action Adaptation and Resiliency Plan, and that'll be a draft in February, so very much not final. Um, and then the, the idea is to present a final plan to the town council in the spring, 
Um, the specific date has yet to be determined, but it'll likely be sometime in late April. Well, I guess my question is to what degree will that plan incorporate implementation measures, steps from how to fund that kind of the difficult questions associated with once you establish a goal, it's easy. But yeah, uh, there, I find to be a challenge. Definitely. Uh, and that's definitely something we'll be incorporating into the plan. Um, and specifically around the funding piece that has been resonant throughout this meeting. Um, but the idea is for um, the plan to really focus on actions that can be taken in the next five years or so. And, um, and then to also sort of establish some longer term visions that we can work towards, um, but to really be very targeted action oriented for the next uh, sort of short term period of time. Um, and to focus on things that are implementable within that time frame. Um, Sarah or Stephanie, did you want to add anything to that? I just wanted to jump in and say that part of that identifying those projects is um, knowing what we need to do is part of how we identify the funding, you know, how we find the funding when those opportunities for funding come up and we have specific items identified, then it makes it possible for us to apply for funds if we've got something already sort of identified as part of a comprehensive plan um, and assuming we'll have some steps and strategies incorporated in that plan as well. Um, so I just, so you're saying that this is gonna be presented to the town council when? In the springtime, probably around the end of April or early May. Yeah. <laughs> Because the reality is this is not a priority to the town council, you know, I'm just being honest. And this is when advocacy comes up and when people need to speak up, right? How we mobilize those grassroots initiatives for people to show up at those meetings, for people to write to the town council to let them know, you know, what their thoughts and thoughts are on, you know, what's being discussed here, um, the proposals, the initiatives, the vision because I'm not sure if the town council is in a place, right? Because again, it comes down to money, mm -hmm. you know, to really understand the, the voices of the people who are the most affected. Yeah. So it sounds like Georgia, <laughs> that folks have I that information agree. about what's going on. I Sorry? completely agree with Georgia. Um, when it came to 132 Northampton Road, there was a town council hearing and we had dozens of people writing to the town council and speaking at that public hearing. And 132 Northampton Road has been before the ta town zoning board of appeals. And again, we've ha had people write in to speak at their meetings and that has a tremendous effect. That's what we need to do. Yeah, you have to mobilize those people. Their voices have to be heard and they have to weigh in. I'm just a representative who doesn't really have much, say, you know what I'm saying? I'm just telling you as a person of color what I feel. But there's so many other people in this town, representative of so many races and perspectives. And, um, you know, so they have to really, be, before it goes before or when it goes or that, you know, what, John just said, you know, the community have to somehow be mobilized to participate in the decision that the town council is going to be waning on, which, like I said, quite frankly, they're not really equipped to do because they lack the lens to really make decisions that impact the BIPOC community. Yeah. Yeah, that's a super important consideration, Georgia, and it sounds like something that this this process can play a role in that mobilization. Um, and, and hopefully all of you as well. Um, any other last thoughts before we sign off? Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Thanks for yeah. being here, Chris. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you, you all, every single yeah. one of you. Thank you so much. It wouldn't be yeah. 
productive without you all here. <laughs> so thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, for all the hard work you do. Oh, thanks. And it's a big, um, it's a big job. <laughs> well, uh, there was a lot of other people doing a lot on this. Uh, the Linnean team, especially Jim and Guzzi Kaya and Lauren. So thank you. I thank you all so much. All right. All right, everyone. Have a Take great care. evening. Have a Stay good evening. Georgia, Georgia, thank you for, for hanging in there and speaking. Uh, really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Get a chance. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone. Good and Georgia, night. I'm always welcoming, you know, anything you ever time you want to vent or anything. Feel free. <laughs> I, I'm here and I'm, I'm always willing to listen. All right. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.